Now this message, and you'll, you'll figure out where I'm going once I get to it, um, some of you may recognize the, the phrase, and, but don't, uh, don't crucify me until you give me an opportunity to develop, develop the message. The title is, Soul Winning is Peanuts. Soul Winning is Peanuts. All right, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where I'll read the whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. An alternate title to this message is No Profit Without Charity. No Profit Without Charity. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. As you're turning there, let me discuss what I mean by that term soul winning, okay? Matthew chapter 23. Soul winning is what I refer to as that boxed out time with the rehearsed lines, that door to door evangelism that we have used as a pattern for reaching the lost, for ministering unto the, the people that are out there in our city, our dark city, our doomed city, our, our city that is not receptible to, receptive to the gospel. One of the best methods that we have come up with is to go to their house, door to door to door to door methodically to reach them with the gospel. Now, if you're in Matthew chapter 23, look with me in verse 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, the Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not left the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Here we find a group known as the scribes, the Pharisees. Christ calls them hypocrites. This is a very scathing sermon that he preached in the presence of all that would hear. And them in particular calling them fools, calling them blind, calling them hypocrites, arrogant in their religious fervor, proud of what they have done. These Pharisees and these scribes and these lawyers made a big deal out of little insignificant works that they were capable of doing. And these works, what profit had they unto others? Now, of course, when you have a bushel of sustenance and you bring it and offer it there's a whole there's a whole bundle of it can do a whole grade of good but these pharisees they're really good at taking their their mint and their anise and their 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 herbs right everybody thinks of their little herb garden it fits in your windowsill so you're going to take one sprout out of that herb garden and tithe that and they were making a big deal out of it which is why christ called them Pharisees and hypocrites. Look at my wonderful work. I pay down to the finest of mites my tithes and mine offerings. And I believe that they were making a show of it. They're blind guides. They strain at a gnat 
and swallow a camel of unrighteousness as a result. They're straining at making at big deal of little insignificant works that are really of no profit unto others, but only glorify themselves as a result. Making big deal out of that, of course, while omitting weightier matters, the Bible says. So they're going to bring the little tithe, omitting the weightier matters, which were judgment, which were mercy, which were faith. Judgment is making right decisions, coming to sensible seclusion, conclusions, doing justice. That's what judgment is. Mercy is, is having compassion or forgiveness when it is it was doubtless in the power to punish or to harm. In other words, withholding judgment, withholding punishment from somebody that does it because you have compassion for them. You have forgiveness for them. That is mercy. Faith. Faith is believing the unbelievable. Faith is trusting without wavering. Ultimately, faith is pleasing God. Faith is Christianity. Judgment is Christianity. Mercy is Christianity. And these have omitted these. These Pharisees, these scribes, these hypocrites, Christ has called them here. Omit these while making a big deal out of their little insignificant works. The tithe of the mint, the tithe of the anise, and showing how great they are for doing it. You blind guides, he says unto them. These were good at doing the dues. And they had left off of following after the duns. You know what that means? We talk about Christianity in the context of religion, and we say this religion and that religion and that religion and that religion, they're all about do, 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 in order to reach your heaven, in order to reach your nirvana, in order to reach your promised land. Do, right? Christianity is done, 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 done. Christ has done it, completed all the good works you simply follow after. You trust him. And these blind guides were good at doing the dues, and they were not so good at following what Christ has done for them. These do their works for to be seen of men, Matthew chapter 6. And that's the only reason why you would bring a tithe of mint. You would bring a tithe of anise. You would bring a tithe of your cumin, these little herbs that grow in your garden. So if you're trying to make a really big deal out of what you are bringing. Certainly they could have added another fistful into the bountiful harvest they're bringing, but no, they're going to kind of finally lay it all out. Their, their tithe is just so. And I believe it's to be seen of men. Look at Matthew chapter 6, and verse 1. It says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men. So this is your giving, to be seen of them. Don't do it before them, to be seen of them. Watch this. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. What's that saying? If you do your alms, if you do your tithes, if you do your, your giving, if you do your, your cleaning, if you do your labors, if you do your soul winning for to be seen of men before men, you have no, you have no, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Continue on in verse 2. Now we're talking about alms. It says, therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. In other words, when it comes time to do your alms, you're not sounding trumpets. You're not making sure everybody knows what you're doing. You're not making sure everyone's attention is on you before you go and you do your good works. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may, be, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. And what is their reward? Glory of men. If you're doing things for to be seen of men, there's your reward. You get glory from them. Wonderful. That'll flee. That'll pass. Men will glorify you for but a moment. The next moment they'll hate you. I've experienced that. Hey, men. <laughs> for to be seen of men, if that's why your works are being done, if you're doing it before men for that purpose, then you have your reward, and your reward is carnal, fleshly, present in this world. And verse 3 says, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. In other words, it ought not to be so calculated, and ought not to be so meticulous as these scribes have shown. Verse 4 says that thine alms may be in secret, that thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. 
And it continues on and says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What's their reward? They got seen by men. They got glory of men for their praying in the streets, making long prayers, wearing long robes is what Christ describes. Verse 6, it says, But thou, okay, so here's what you ought to do. But thou, when thou prayest, when thou doest thine alms, when thou givest, when thou does good works, right? Enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The glory that the Father comes through a humble heart that serves in secret, serves so that they're not seen, serves so that they don't have glory of men, but that they glorify the Father, and that gives opportunity for God to enter in and glorify them. We ought to be aware and beware of the Spirit that is in all of us to want to please men and want to have glory of men. All of us don't like when people hate us, okay? Even if you're one of these recluse playing video games at home, you like to be at home maybe with a book or whatever, you say, oh, I'm one of these socially adept, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people that would prefer to get shut away. You still don't like when people don't like you. That's naturally in us. And generally, there's nothing wrong with that. But beware of that spirit that starts to turn that into some sort of self-aggrandizement, some sort of building yourself up, because that's exactly what these Pharisees had. All their works they did so that they could get a taste of that grandizement from men, that glory of men. They thrived on that. They did works so that they could be seen of men. And ultimately, this was one of their biggest downfalls. Go to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. One book to the right. Matthew, Mark. <clears throat> and in Mark chapter 12, you'll be over there in verse 38. Now, clearly our works are to be done before God's face. God will be the one that rewards you openly. Don't go seeking an open reward, but seek the Father. It's plain. It's simple. Matthew chapter 12 Beginning in verse 38, and he says, And said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing, and love salutations in the marketplace, and the chief seats in the synagogue, and the uppermost rooms at the feast. Okay, and to a certain extent, we all love that. We all love to have attention when we enter into a room. We all love when it's our birthday, let's say, and everyone's so happy to see you and rejoicing in you. That feels good, doesn't it? People bring us to the center of the attention and they're going to sing to you and they're going to, they're going to glorify you and lift you up. But these scribes, they loved it. They relished in it. They wanted to soak this up. These scribes and these Pharisees, they just wanted attention from men loving the law, loving the salutation, loving to be seen above others. But look at verse 40, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. A greater damnation is reserved for that attitude, for that mentality, for that spirit that loves to be seen as some sort of religious hero, but all the while they're destroying widows' houses, devouring them in their substance, and for a pretense making long prayers. It's like the Catholic Church that takes all the money so that they can say a last rite to some poor old widow, and they promise and they sell her a ticket to heaven that winds her up in hell. That's wickedness. And those shall receive a greater damnation. But take heed to yourself because that same spirit can be present in you if you start to learn to love the attention that comes from your good works. You shouldn't do good works ever for the purpose of being seen of men. Sounding a trumpet before you. Doo -doo -doo, I'm about to tithe. Who saw that? Thank you. Come on. That's not Christianity. That's not doing your works for the Father. That's doing your works for yourself. Continuing on in verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. Many that were rich cast in much. There came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites which made a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all 
they which have cast into the treasury. Giving ought not be a show. Your doings ought not glorify yourself. The Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was crucified for me. Look at all the great works that he has done. We ought to glory in his works. We ought to glory in him and nothing else. Glory in Christ. Here Christ looks to this poor widow and he sees the rich man coming with a bag of dough and dropping it in the offering. He sees the rich man, the rich farmer, coming with a bag of grain and dropping it down. He could barely lift the thing. And then he sees this widow come up, and I believe Christ was probably the only one that saw this widow come up. Drop in her two mites, which make a farthing, and Christ gathers together his disciples. I bet you everyone missed it. So he says, did you see that? Did you see that woman? Did you see her cast in her two mites? Verily I say unto you that she has cast in more than all of them. And they're like, huh, but there's, there's a pile of money. There's a pile of grain. There's a pile of meat. And, and these mites are more? Well, we'll look at verse 44. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had even all her living. It's almost another way of saying, you know what, she gave her living. She gave her life. She gave everything to God in that moment and revealed her heart that though she had nothing else, she didn't have two mites to rub together once it had fallen in there, right? Christ looked at that and said, wow, she's given it all. She's given all of her living and she did so without sounding a trumpet and she did so with the right attitude and she did so with a heart that just wanted to be a blessing unto the Lord and you know what Christ likely did? He just turned that blessing on her. He rewarded her openly as he promised. She had done her alms in secret. She had done her good works in secret and God was primed and ready to reward her openly. That's how we ought to be as Christians. Doing our good works in secret, so that it's not seen of men, is the focus. So that it's not sounding a trumpet. So it's not, look at me, right before I do something great for God. So that saying, soul winning is peanuts. Soul winning is peanuts, is what I'm getting to here. Regarding salvation, soul winning, remember that's the knocking on the door with a prepared gospel presentation, going door to door to door that we box out a Saturday time for. That is peanuts. In regard to salvation, the Bible says in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Even though salvation is not affected by my ability to go soul winning, to go knocking doors, to go and do good works. It's amazing how many people, maybe they don't believe it, but they certainly act like it hinges upon it. Their whole salvation is based upon their ability to go and knock doors a certain time of the week, at a certain hour, for a certain length of time. And we see this all the time. I have heard people in our circles basically bring someone's salvation into question because they don't go soul winning enough or at all or whatever. Soul winning has nothing to do with your salvation. Amen. Yet a Catholic woman offered that up to us yesterday, didn't she? She said, I, I preach the gospel. I'm <laughs> like, wow. Mm -hmm. Right? Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're in... Verse 22, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are wonderful Christians. Hand quotes in the air. I've never cast out devils. I mean, they're doing great and wonderful works. Many wonderful works. And I believe that that Catholic lady at the door that said part of her salvation, aside from being attached to, uh, you know, Il Papa, the Pope, you know, calling himself Father, was Jesus, Ill, like, legitimately condemned. 
she's putting her trust in that, but she offers up her ability to preach the gospel to people. I believe that she probably was a better person than me. It could be. She could have gave more money. She could have loved more people. She could have blessed more people. Who knows? It's very possible that she was a better, quote, hand quote, Christian than I was, doing all of the right things, but she had omitted the weightier matters of what Christianity is. And the most important commandment that we can keep is to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But it doesn't say believe and read your Bible. It doesn't say believe and pray. It doesn't say believe and give your money. It doesn't say believe and go soul winning to be saved. Simply trust Christ. Soul winning is peanuts when it comes to salvation. Soul winning is peanuts also when it comes to our sanctification. Okay? It's been said, and I've heard it multiple times, and you can look at the church in Ephesus where they said, you have left your first love, you have, you have left your first works. The command was to do the first works. It's been said that that first works is referring specifically to and exclusively and only soul winning. The Ephesus church in Revelation chapter 2, they're being condemned by God because they left off the first works. The first works is soul winning. They're not soul winning enough. They're not going around and knocking on doors and preaching the gospel to people. Now, regarding our sanctification, do we believe that soul winning is the first works, the primary works, the highest importance? Let's be careful. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Let's be careful not to take our own opinions, stretch the Bible, and, and, and make it say what we want to say. I don't believe that the first works that Ephesus is missing is soul winning, like we think, knocking on doors, going and preaching the gospel to every creature. Don't stretch the Bible. Rather, let's go look at a passage because we're talking about first works and first love. Let's go to a passage that talks about works and love and commandments and puts it all together and is a teaching from Christ. Don't you think that would be a great way to figure out what the Bible is saying in Revelation chapter 2? You have left thy first love. Do the first works. Okay, let's go find someone that's talking about love, someone that's talking about works, and someone that's talking about the commands of God. And that's Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 28. Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 28. No, nope, Mark, sorry. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. I built way up to that and then just left you hanging. Mark 12 and verse 28. <clears throat> Mark 12 and verse 28. And one of the scribes came. Isn't it amazing that every time there's some sort of dispute, these scribes and these Pharisees are the ones that show up. One of these scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? The first works, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, and remember the context also talked about first love. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. This is the first works. Love the Lord with all. Verse 31, and the second is namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So do I think that the Ephesus church was being, being faulted for not soul winning? No, I think that they were being faulted for not loving the Lord with all and loving their neighbor as themselves. Soul winning is peanuts and easy compared to what I've just read you. Don't you think it's a lot easier to go out and, of course, it's nerve-wracking and, of course, you face hardships, and of course, you're getting exercise, and of course, the weather's not always great. But don't you think just getting out and doing that, even if you're not very good at it, knocking on the door, handing them a flyer, and saying, do you want to hear the gospel? They're like, no. You want to hear the gospel? No. That's a lot easier, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but it's a lot easier than loving the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And these commandments are called the greatest of all. 
I think that's the challenge. I think that's what's difficult in the Christian life. And, uh, and Jesus, when talking to Pharisees, who would probably be, if they had, you know, crawled over into New Testament Christianity and, and had tried to feign themselves to be believers on Christ, if they would have climbed into that and got on board with Christ's command to go and preach the gospel to every creature, I think they would have a lot better time and an easier time of doing the routine and getting that type of work done. And you know what they probably would do? They'd make a trumpet sound before them and they'd show everybody, I'm about to go soul winning. Text everybody in the world and, and sound the trumpet and let everybody know the gospel's going out because I'm going to go and preach it and I'm going to go and knock on the doors and they're going to sound the trumpet. And Jesus would have the same condemnation for them then as they had in the passage that we read at the beginning. You tithe and mint and anise. You go and you knock your doors for one hour a week, two hours a week. You do four hours a week. Great, wonderful. But you've omitted the weightier matters. Judgment, mercy, faith. Or how about this? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. These are weightier matters than simply going through the activity of soul winning as defined by our groups. <clears throat> Judgment, faith, mercy, these are weightier matters. But to love God and to love others, certainly that is something of great weight and a great challenge to any believer. You realize the gravity of trying to love God with all? <laughs> your mind. How often does your mind wander? Your heart, the, your, your very being, the core of you all thy strength and I put my strength into a lot of other things other than serving God like bicycling I, I go and I ride my bicycle I put strength into that but I ought to put that into the Lord it's everything that ought to be given unto God as that widow she cast in all her living God wants us and commands us to cast in all our living your lively everything that you are your whole life ought to be given unto him who's fallen short of that <laughs> amen <clears throat> Soul winning, finally, is peanuts. And this was, this was the original context of which this came in. Early on in the days of the church, I was challenged by men who usurped authority from under me that they had freely given unto me, because authority is only authority if it's given by somebody. So the church called me to come and serve here. They gave that authority over me. We had discussions about how soul winning would be managed, and I said I couldn't possibly do this as I'm trying to transition three months into the foundation of this church. <clears throat> And so the challenge came, and God, you know, Josh isn't soul winning, was, was the charge, right? With us. You know, they forgot to leave that off, because mm -hmm. certainly I got lots of work done out of sight, right? Not seen of men. But anyways, the challenge was brought up to me, and even so much so that the scenario that we had with my pastor watching over me, the church being independent as, as, a, as an autonomous group, Right? They went behind my back to speak to a pastor who's now a good friend of mine and asked him, would you become our pastor? Therefore, are you usurping authority. And you know what I said to them? I said, look, guys, soul winning is peanuts. I was mad. Okay, this is, I almost quit. I almost quit at this meeting because I, I, was, I was hot, fuming. I said, soul winning is peanuts in comparison to getting this rotten, rebellious attitude out of the church. Amen. <clears throat> because they had carried it forth from their previous split, and they would probably set it forth in a previous If they had a church now, which they're probably not in, they'd have that same rebellious and rotten spirit. That's right. That was the weightier matter. Compared to removing rotten attitudes and, and motives from our lives, soul winning, here's the gospel, is peanuts. Jesus said specifically in one of the greatest moments of exodus from his church, when, when the, he, had, he had the biggest gathering around him that suddenly was like, whoa, I'm out and just took off. He said these words, the flesh profiteth nothing. And he had hordes of people from that time, John 6, 6, 6. From that time, many disciples drew back and walked no more with him. 
The flesh profiteth nothing. People hate that message. But this is the problem that I find with this soul winning, as we call it, the boxed out time, the, 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 the manufactured presentation that I rehearsed in front of a mirror, the robotic way that we go door to door to door looking for somebody who we can walk methodically through this prayer and then, and then have them pray and then count them, ringing a bell and shouting. Usually we announce we're going beforehand too, to just to make sure everybody knows. What, what the problem with that is that it's flesh. It's 100% flesh. And we see tons of people in our circles, and we're all guilty of it at times, of doing spiritual activities completely in the flesh. The flesh profiteth nothing. Remember what Jesus said? Verily, you have your reward if your reward is to seek the glory of men. If your, world, if your reward that you're seeking is self-aggrandizement, applause, you have it. There you go. Enjoy. But if you want to be rewarded of the Father which is in heaven, do your alms in secret. Don't sound a trumpet before thee. We got to do right because it's right. And we got to do right because we love God. It really have to be the only two reasons. Do right because it's right, and do right because we love God. Sometimes we don't feel loving and in a relationship with God. There are days I feel super carnal and super fleshy, but I know that I got to get up and I got to come to church and I got to preach and be spiritual. But I don't always feel spiritual, okay? But I come here and I do right because it's right. There are times when I come and I'm flying high in love with God and just really enjoying that fellowship. And I do right because I love God. And those together are the greatest ways to work with God. Love Him and do right because God said, this is what you ought to do and that's right and I'm going to do right. But if you do right with the wrong motive, if you do right in the flesh, if you do right for to be seen and have praise of men, you have your reward here in this life and will receive nothing of the Father which is in heaven. That was the promise. We read that earlier. So what is the answer then? What is the whole conclusion of the matter when it comes to my good works? Okay? The conclusion of the whole matter is I need to have the right spirit. Go to 1 Timothy. I need to have the right heart. I need to have the right motives. When I'm doing anything far as serving God goes. <clears throat> Soul winning is peanuts regarding our salvation. No one's saved because they go and knock doors. Soul winning is peanuts regarding sanctification. You aren't holier than somebody else just because you go and knock doors. And look, we can add all sorts of different activities. You know, I'm not holier than anybody because I stand up here and preach. You're not holier than anybody because you, you collect the offering. You're not holier than anybody because you give tithe. No. If you're doing it for to be seen of man, you have your reward. It's the same playing field. <clears throat> First Timothy, we're looking at the answer. What's the conclusion of the matter with respect to our works? Look at 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5. Now the end of the commandment, the finality of the commandment. We've reached the finish line here. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. That's the end of the commandment. This is, this is where our fulfilling of the commandments ought to stop. The buck stops here. Have a good conscience. Have a pure heart and have faith unfeigned. Believing God and trusting God as you're following after God with that pure heart. A heart that's not seeking to lift itself up. And a good conscience. You're doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it with a clear conscience. That's what is the end of the matter when it comes to our works. <clears throat> now, I as the Apostle Paul, you know this, I'm not opposed to soul winning. I'm not trying to stomp on soul winning. I'm not trying to make it cease here because there's weightier matters to deal with. No, I'm trying to, as the Apostle Paul does, have that simply be an expression of who you are as a believer. Your soul winning ought to be an expression of the love you have for the Lord, your God, which is of all your heart and of all your soul and of all your mind, fully given unto him. It ought to also be an expression of your love towards your neighbor. You ought not be soul winning to lift yourself up. You ought not be grudgingly going through the motions of doing soul winning or going through the motions of any religious activity whatsoever. You ought to do it with the right spirit, and here the Apostle Paul says, with a pure heart, of a good conscience, and of 
faith unfeigned. Look at verse 9. It says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Down in verse 11 it says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed unto our trust, unto my trust. And, and amen, that gospel has been committed to your trust. This is a part of your Christian life. When you were saved and received that gospel, it wasn't so you could hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Right? Don't put it under a bed. No, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. We've been committed that gospel for the purpose of obeying it, for the purpose of using it, for the purpose of sharing it, being encouraged by it. That gospel was committed unto us, and we need to be thankful for the fact that we are enabled with that power of that gospel to succeed in delivering of it. Look at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, that he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And you all have a ministry. It's called the Ministry of Reconciliation. Praise the Lord that you've been given the call to reconcile lost sinners with the Father that loves them. You go, lost sinner, Father that loves them. And you put their hands together. You reconcile them together. And you've been given that ministry. We ought to thank God for that. But not only have you been put into that ministry, look at that, enabled me. You're enabled. You're empowered. You're given everything you need to fulfill that ministry. But, 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 but we need to keep the right perspective when it comes to that ministry. Because this is the problem. Look at verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was before this blasphemer. He was before this injurious person. He was before this Pharisee of the Pharisees, but he obtained mercy. And this is the perspective by which the Apostle Paul lives the entirety of his ministry. Remember from the pit from whence you were dug and the cleft of the rock from whence you are hewn. Remember where you came from when you're ministering unto others. Verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first, in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which hereafter should believe on him to life everlasting. The Apostle Paul is saying that, look, I was the chiefest of sinners, and Christ used me as an example to show you the type of people that he's ready to pull out of the fire. And the Apostle Paul, in reflecting on that, realized that I'm nothing apart from Christ. My whole ministry and my whole being and my whole purpose ought to be in weightier matters, and the weightiest matter of all is to love him and his grace and his mercy that he extended to me. And to Seek to love others in the same way that he loved me. Being in the ministry of reconciliation, showing people what God did to me first. That's what soul winning should be. It should be an expression of the love of God that he gave to you, and you're simply showing it to others. That's a far cry from the religious rigmarole of knocking the door and reading a script and making someone pray and running away going, Woohoo! I got somebody saved! Right? The, the, the verbiage is there. Paul, Paul says, I saved some. I, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying I got somebody saved. But what's your heart when you're saying that? What's your motive when you're saying that? And too many times, I'm guilty of it the same. It's like, I've made a really good gospel presentation that one. Yeah, got him. Nailed it. No, 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 no. It was Christ. He showed in you the pattern of what he hopes to do for everybody, bringing them hereafter to believe and receive life everlasting. And that needs to be the right perspective and focus of our gospel ministry. We need to be a gracious recipient as well as a gracious dispenser of the gospel. And if we're not, go to 1 Corinthians 13, then your soul winning is peanuts. It's nothing. If you're walking around knocking doors in the flesh, if you're patting yourself on the back, sounding the trumpet before you go and rejoicing in yourself after the fact, verily I say unto you, you have your reward. 
I would say soul winning is peanuts if you've got a rotten spirit and you're a grump. I would say soul winning is peanuts if you're a railer and injurious to others, especially believers. I would say soul winning is peanuts if you're proud and covetous as a person. I would say soul winning is peanuts if you're doing it for self-serving motives and to be seen of men. I would say soul winning is peanuts if you're not doing it actively in faith and charity. Soul winning is peanuts. Because all of these things are weightier matters than your activity that you're trying to do in the flesh. And we can honestly, again, insert any work here. I just like picking on this one because by and large amongst our friends and our circles, this is the biggest problem. People think that they're delivered to do such things because they're a soul winner. We've got fornicators with, with impregnated girlfriends, but they're a soul winner. We've got men that think that they're going to leave their families and go and be a soul winner as a missionary on the other side of the world. And that's okay because they're a soul winner. we got men that don't go to church, darken the doors of a congregation ever because they're a soul winner. We've got, we've got so many people that think they're delivered to do wickedness, but they're a soul winner. I just hear it so often. Oh man, I didn't realize that guy was such a, an awful bad person. He's a pretty good soul winner. That's not the standard. The standard is Christ. He is the benchmark. He is the bar. And loving him to the fullest and loving your neighbor as yourself is the bar that men can achieve. That's it. And that bar is too high for any of us to achieve. Why? Because I love me some me. I love myself. To try to love somebody else to that extent is a challenge. I don't get along with people all the time. People make me mad. I never make me mad, so what's the deal? How, do I, how can I love somebody as I love me? I'm awesome. We start to think that way, don't we? In our, in our interactions, right? And that's a problem. That's a problem that we need to correct. Paul begins this chapter, 1 Corinthians. He says, though I, though I, though I, though I. And insert any wonderful Christian work here. Though I speak with the tongues of angels. Though I have the gift of prophecy. Though I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor. Though I go soul winning, look at, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And I'll say this, it profiteth everybody else nothing. If you don't have charity, if you don't have love when you're going and you're doing your good deeds and serving Christ, it profits you nothing. We've seen several verses that say, if you want a reward that is on this earth, you got it, enjoy. But God will reward those who serve him secretly or humbly, it's not, it's not saying that somebody can't see you giving your offering. It's just saying, what's your, what's your spirit like? What's your, what's your attitude like when you do serve? Are you, are, you, are you making sure that everybody sees and is looking your way before you drop the money in the offering, right? Or are you just, you know, let not your left hand know what your right hand doing? Before you go soul winning, do you make sure everybody knows? Hey, guys, we're just looking for a prayer request. I want you to start praying for me because I'm going soul winning. I'm going to share it with everybody. Hey, everybody, I'm going soul winning. In about two hours, I'm going to be going soul winning. Come start praying for me. And let everybody know. And then afterwards, you're like, I got 20 people saved. I'm so awesome. This is great. Right? What's the attitude? What's the spirit when it comes to serving God? Serve Him. Don't serve yourself. It profits you nothing. It profits you nothing. It profits you nothing. I want these people to know if you are soul winning in the flesh, no reward. None. Unless you want the reward of somebody clapping for you here. It's not a very good reward. But if you soul win in the spirit, if you soul win with a proper heart, a heart here of charity, you can have a reward in heaven that never fadeth away, that does not rust nor corrupt. A reward eternal in the heavenlies. Look at verse 4. Charity suffereth long. It's patient, right? We need to have charity when we're soul winning. We need to long suffer with people. I got, I got people in here that I've seen are heartful soul winners that will long suffer with people. They're not looking to get to the next verse. They're not looking to get to the next door. They want to suffer with people, put up with people, share with people, really make them understand. Charity needs to be a part of your soul winning or it profits you nothing. Suffereth long with people and is kind, a kindness to it. How often do you see people when they're going to try to share the gospel and they're like, you're to die today, would you go to heaven? Oh man, I, 
I just don't. I like you're a Catholic. That's 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 garbage. That horrible religion. Like, what are you doing with this thing? And they're not kind about it. They're not graciously leading people along. No, you need charity that is kind. It envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. You know what that is? Look at me. I'm a wonderful soul owner. I've seen that so many times. It makes me sick. Honestly, it makes me sick to see puffed up soul winners. Okay. If anybody's got saved, it's been because of God, because your spirit is wretched. <laughs> seen it a hundred times. My spirit can be wretched too. I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I can have a wretched spirit when it comes to going out and doing Christian works. We're all guilty of this. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. If you don't have these aspects of your ministry, You've got nothing. It profits you nothing. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. I don't know. Sometimes we like to celebrate just how sinful the people are that we meet at the door, and we like to get on their backs. Don't we rejoicing in iniquity a little bit? I think we should stop doing that. I think we should rejoice in the truth, and the truth goes forward. And you hear people say the truth even. I, I've heard people say the truth in the wrong words, and I try to rejoice in that. You hear that sometimes, right, at the door. People will explain things a little bit differently, but you're like, yeah. That's, that's right, I'd explain it this way, but, you know, that's, that's great. I'm rejoicing in that truth you've said. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's faith. When you're willing to bear, when you're willing to believe and hope and endure all things, you just have this general faithful attitude about you. In other words, you're not accounting for your own way of guiding a situation. You're just going to, you're going to bear with people. You're going to believe the best of people. You're going to hope that people can pull through and, 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 and live for God. You're going to endure when people are hurting you and treating you wrong. That's charity, and that needs to be a part because charity never faileth. It will never fail. It will never be done with. But you know what? A lot of our things, like I've, I've been alluding, alluding to this, you know, prophecies, they shall fail. Tongues, they shall cease. Knowledge, it shall vanish away. The, the freedom to go door to door to door in our country may be gone. It may fail, but you know what? We'll never fail charity. And if charity is a part of your ministry, you'll still reach those people. You'll still get the gospel out. You'll still do the soul winning, but you'll be doing it with the right motive, with the right heart, with the right intentions, and you'll be receiving a right reward as a result. I would rather, rather than have an army of door knockers, an army of soul winners in this church, rather than have that, even for myself, rather than me being an excellent, prim and proper, toned, honed, excellent soul winner, door to door, rather than that, I would rather be and I would rather have within our congregation people that are an example of a complete, rounded believer. A great example of what a Christian is. I would rather have that than the soul winner. I would rather have somebody, and I would rather personally be someone that shows mercy, that shows judgment, that shows faith, that offers charity unto people around me than be a, than be a, a great soul winner. I would rather be a great husband and a great dad. I would rather have great moms in here. I'd rather have, have, have great older brothers, great examples to people, just doing the best they can to be a part of a family. I would rather have that in the church than a soul winner any day. I would rather have prayer wars. I'd rather be a prayer warrior. Really be able to get a hold of God and get something done on my knees. And, and have God move in the midst of us because we are praying people. I'd rather have that than a, than a soul winner. Structured, regimented, soul winner any day. I would rather just have Christians that mind the, the weightier matters. Christians that act like Christ. I'd rather have that than a bunch of people, and my, me myself, just, just drag my rotten, stinking carcass up to the door with a snotty attitude. Hey, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? The guy's probably a reprobate anyways. <clears throat> There is more to the Christian life than just doing deeds. You're not saved by deeds. Why do you think you're sanctified by deeds? Why do you think you grow in Christ with good deeds? The Bible doesn't say grow in works. It says grow in grace and in the knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior. Grace is that free gift that you first received. You didn't do anything for it. You simply received it. Grow in that. Do more things that you didn't receive. You know what that is? That's Christ working through you. That's a gift. That's, that's All you can say when Christ works through you in situation is, wow, I was used. I didn't do anything. It's just God wanting to work with me. That's great. That's glorious. And I would rather have that, people led of the Spirit and having God work through them, I'd rather have that than a whole bunch of people just trying to, trying to do a bunch of good works and glorify themselves in it. You know why? Because I can take people that have the right Spirit and we can teach them the soul. We can teach them the structure. We can teach them the regiment. But if they start with a good heart, that's, that's moldable, pliable. God wants to use that and can be directed in the direction and do the right thing. But you can't take the other quite often. You can't take somebody that's all about the works. You can't take a scribe or a Pharisee and teach them charity, teach them love, teach them a pure conscience, teach them. You can't teach them these things. God has to build them up in that. Maybe this is our problem sometimes, is we get somebody saved and we're right out there, go soul winning, do the good works, but we've never dealt with the weightier matters and taught them to live like Christ. Honestly, if you're living like Christ, you will get the works done. They'll just be a natural offshoot of him living in you and through you. You won't have to force it. You won't have to schedule a time to be a Christian. You'll always be a Christian. Moment by moment, day by day, always Christian. God working in you and through you. That's what we need. That's what we need. Because, like I said, the structure, it shall cease. Prophecies will cease. Tongues will fail. Knowledge will vanish away one day. And we may not be able to live the same way we're living. But can we still be Christians? Yeah. The world can't stop you from being a Christian. They may stop us from congregating and assembling. They may stop us from soul winning. But even if you're locked up in an inner prison, you know what the Apostle Paul found? They couldn't stop him from being a Christian. They'd have to cut your tongue out. (laughs) Stop you from preaching the word, singing praises to God, praying unto him. I can pray in my heart. You have to kill me if you want me to stop being a Christian. Right? That's what we need. Because that's the only thing that never fails is charity, the love with God and the love that God does through us. Charity. Without it, we got no profit under the sun. Ask Solomon about that. Thank you, Father, for this day and for your word, God. To God be the glory. Work in us, God.